Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. And uh, today's guest, man, an exciting one. All our guests are exciting. The reason why this guest is a particularly exciting one is, you know, it's not easy to book a CEO of a major med tech company that's number one. Two, our guest today, um, you know, doesn't just go on any shows. You know, I think he's only got a handful of videos and podcasts that are already out there. And so I was really excited to do this. You know, back when I started my career at Mozilla Robotics, I was in the spine industry, and there was one company that always stood out to me for doing just remarkable uh, things and innovation. And of course, they had a phenomenal booth. I felt like everything from the company's website to their booth design to their products just was designed so well and with so much intention. And that company is Brain Lab. And so today's guest uh, is Stefan Wilschmeyer, their founder and CEO. And here's what's interesting about him. Uh, if you read his LinkedIn uh, bio, you know, he says that you know, both professionally and personally, he wants to have an impact in, in whatever he does. And this drive was his motivation in 1980 when he first created Brain Lab. And of course, today, you know, that company has grown to over 2,200 passionate, talented employees across the globe uh, who contributed their ideas, their creativity, and know how to make product impact on lives of patients every single day. Brain Lab essentially focuses on transforming healthcare through software, but of course they have a suite of really amazing uh, hardware. And essentially, uh, for over a quarter of a century, uh, they've been in the areas of surgery and radiation therapy, developing hardware and software technology to help healthcare providers, physicians, and their patients fight cancer and other conditions of the brain and body. And so in this episode, we cover the very rare and untold story of Brain Lab and how does Stefan start this company? Interesting fact, he's never worked at another company in his life because he started Brain Lab uh, when he was a teenager. And so it's a remarkable story. And personally, um, I, I don't know how Stefan's, you know, story is not being just shouted from the <laughs> rooftops of MedTech because it is probably the most remarkable story. I personally would love if Netflix did a movie on it. I think it's, you know, and again, I'm not saying that just to say that. When you hear this interview, from how he started the company to um, all the wild things that happened for him. You know, at one point when he was, you know, a kid, I think, I think he was like in his early 20s, he mentioned, he was literally being sued by the Austrian government. So if you want to know what exactly, how that, how that happened, um, listen to this episode. It's a great one. And I'm very grateful for him to come on the show. It's a ph phenomenal company, great founder, and just a story that makes me proud to work in this industry. Before we get into the episode, of course, we got to give a big shout out, big thanks to my partners over at Clary. Let's face it, um, you know, CRMs are really important. We all invest in Salesforce for a reason, but nobody has ever said, man, I crush quota thanks to Salesforce. So in order to protect that investment and really leverage AI to get the most out of your data, you need something like Clary. Clary essentially plugs into your Salesforce uh, CRM and extracts the data in a, different, in a couple of different ways. Number one, it helps your reps automate the data entry. That way, a lot of data that is usually not entered into Salesforce finally makes its way in there. And then at the, at the end of every quarter, month, week, whatever it is, your sales leader are armed with the best possible information to make the best possible decisions when it comes to running revenue. Clary is designing a category around revenue governance and collaboration. I've always believed that to actually drive and grow revenue, it's not just something that the sales team is focused on. It's something that's across the organization. And so uh, Clary is the one thing that you have to have. So whether you're a startup just getting started or you're a more established company like a brain lab, you need to get Clary. So uh, be sure to click the, sh uh, the show notes below. There's a link to get a demo with them. You'll learn a lot on that link. Uh, they do uh, a great analysis and demo, so be sure to do that. Or go to Clary.com. That's C-L-A-R-I.com. Mention the show, so that way they can book you right away. And 
in related news, very exciting news, I'm making my return back to the Bay Area. Nope, I'm not moving back. Uh, but after a few years, I'm actually making my way back to the Bay Area for Dreamforce. Uh, that's Salesforce's big annual conference. I'm going to be there on Wednesday, September 13th, because Clary and I are teaming up and we're going to have another amazing event together. This time, uh, Clary has rented out the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center in San Francisco. I'll be joined on stage with Kyle Coleman and a special guest speaker from the med tech industry. We're still confirming that. Our fireside talk is going to be about how life science companies can boost revenue with digital sales maturity model. It's going to be an awesome event. There's going to be some amazing people there. It's free. It's open. Wednesday, September 13th from 11.30 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. Um, but I believe there is a cap. So check the show notes below. Click that link. Go and just enter your email so you can RSVP or just check my LinkedIn. It's going to be somewhere on there. And finally, hey, let's face it, everybody, selling today is more difficult than ever. Whether you're a rep or a sales leader, driving technology adoption is not, you know, it's not like the old ways. You can't just walk into the hospital and talk to a surgeon. You can't just rely on the one or two annual meetings that you go to to see your customers. That's why having a more uh, effective approach using digital, specifically social media, to drive uh, product adoption is going to help. Um, I put together a program called the Medical Sales Network Effects Program. Not only is it available for uh, individuals to purchase and, and, and use for their own training, but I also do team packages. Now, one of my favorite stories is the one you're about to hear right now. Just a quick minute of this testimony from a rep uh, in the spine space who after a couple of weeks was able to get this remarkable result uh, using LinkedIn and some of the strategies he learned from the program. I tried to reach out to this one surgeon. I posted recently on LinkedIn about launching a bunch of new products in this year in 2023. He accepted my connection request, liked that comment, and two days later booked a case with this new technology that we had showed them two days later or two days prior. So it was like all like a methodical step. So in the surgery yesterday went pretty well. He agreed to try it again. Um, so I think from our standpoint, it was a, it was a win, win, win of getting the connection on LinkedIn to seeing our content, having a good inner office meeting from a standpoint of being able to talk with the surgeon about the new technology and what his peer was doing, and then having a successful case where he would want to use the product again. Now, imagine if your entire sales team was trained to get results just like that without leaving their home, you know, taking advantage of things like LinkedIn, where your customers are already having their conversations. So how can your team get more effective using email, LinkedIn, other social media platforms and being more persuasive to drive awareness on your product? I'd love to talk to you and help you out. If you're interested, go ahead and click the link below and head over to my website, katibandco.com and book that time with me to learn how I can do a special training for you and your team. And if you're a rep and you're ready to just invest in yourself and go to the next level, 85% of the reps in my program are self-funded, meaning that they went ahead and just invest, invested in themselves and joined the program. The program is amazing content, a private group for you to network, plus live weekly calls. If you're interested in that, click the show notes below and you'll see that I've included a nice discount for you because you know what? If you're listening to this episode, you're listening to this show, you're somebody interested in your own personal development, I want to reward that. So Finally, before we jump into it, I want to remind you, if you're a clinician, you can get a CME credit from listening to this episode. That's right. It's a free CME credit, an AMA PRA category one CME credit. So listen to this episode, click the show notes below and unlock that CME credit. All you got to do is just write a few sentences of what you learned. And if you're a med tech company interested to learn how you can put a CME on any piece of content you have, whether it's a podcast and a virtual demo, a uh, booth demo, a uh, blog, whatever it might be, go ahead and go to katibandco.com to learn more. So now, after all of those announcements, let's get on to our episode. Enjoy. Hey, everyone. Everyone, Welcome back to the show. I'm so excited to uh, have this guest with me. You know, uh, over 10, 12 years ago, uh, I left medical school and I was looking to enter the industry of med tech. And you know, robotics was a big thing. I was lucky enough to get started at Missouri Robotics. I remember when I became the first U.S. marketing manager, when I would go to the conference, there was a lot of exciting technology companies, but there's one that really always stood out to me, not in terms of their just their technology. Their booth was fantastic. Their people were amazing. And the culture was always there and it was radiating. And recently I was at AANS. I went by this booth and I talked to him. I said, you know what? I really want to have your founder on my show. 
And I was told like, that would be very difficult to do. I said, Hey, you know what? But I'm very persuasive. And it took a few months, but here he is. Uh, Stefan, Wales, uh, uh, see, I, I told you I was going to, I wasn't going to mess up. I already messed up. Wilsmeyer. Thank you so much, Stefan, for coming on the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, glad that you have been persistent and uh, got me on your show. Absolutely. 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 And, you know, I, I have to tell you, you know, um, with Brain Lab, you know, aside from, you know, I told you earlier and I, and this is a, the highest compliment. I feel that, you know, if Apple had a medical device company, it would be Brain Lab, not just in terms of the technology that you guys have, but the branding, the culture, everything is very you know, in, 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 in uniform and in very, in very good symbiosis with, with each other. And so I want to talk to you like a lot about how you started the company because technically, and this is very interesting, you've never worked at any other company except for Brain Lab. And so why don't we kind of start at the very beginning, which is, you know, where did you grow up and what was life like for you? So as a, as a child, I was always very creative. I liked to build things, uh, you know, whether it was out of clay or paper at, or wood. And uh, so then the sudden I got my first computer when I was 15. And if you don't start at uh, seven or eight, uh, you're never going to be very good at software. And uh, so, but for me, you know, I, the sudden f felt that a computer was another tool to be creative, but now you could really scale your creativity because it was just limitless. And uh, so it was very easy to, you know, move away from clay and paper and wood to, you know, into the digital age. And uh, I was just blown away by what a Commodore 64 at the time, you know, was able to to offer. And uh, while I, you know, had uh, a vector geometry at school and, uh, you know, which was like a very dry and, uh, you know, boring subject, I looked at, you know, how would that translate to what I could do on this, uh, you know, newly acquired Commodore 64. And I started um, trying to program uh, 3D graphics. And uh, when I turned 16, I started writing a book on 3D software. And uh, that book uh, ended up uh, selling, uh, you know, 50,000 copies in just the first year. And wow. that was, in fact, a lot because uh, there was only 1 million Commodore 64s in Germany. So one out of 20 people bought that uh, book, which was by a factor of three, um, basically more copies than uh, basically that um, yeah, publishing agency had ever sold. And um, that was also the reason why I actually ended up uh, getting a lot of proceeds from the book because I negotiated that um, I would. Uh, I asked him what was the highest number of uh, you know books they've ever sold, and they would say uh, seventeen thousand. And then I said, okay, after fifteen thousand, I want the double um, royalty, and after twenty thousand, triple. And uh, of course, I agreed. And uh, so then, actually, they the... said no one's going to do that. <laughs> exactly. And so then the book was in fact quite lucrative, and. Um, I got about uh, $75,000 from that book, which for a person that then eventually just graduated from uh, from high school, which was in 1987, that was a fortune. That's all. That is a lot of money. How old were you at that time? Um, I I was 19. Wow. So at age 19, you, you had a best-selling book. You negotiated a, a very aggressive royalty contract, succeeded, and then you ended up with how, how much money again? $75,000. That's that that might as well. I guess if you account for inflation, and everything that might be half a million, maybe a million dollars today. I mean, I'll tell you. I mean, it's it's hard to make that kind of money off a book today. Even that's that's amazing. You know, the only other person. So I got to be careful because you know, you know, I I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to get uh, 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 talking up too much. But you know, the only other person who I know who negotiated such an aggressive royalty contract was Michael Jordan. His mother negotiated with Nike. Oh, we want to get paid for every shoe. And that is ne that had never been done before. And um, uh, uh, the, the founder of, of Nike, uh, Phil Knight at the time said, okay, like, let's just do it. Like how much, how much is he going to sell? Just like maybe a million dollars this year. And then that year they sold $120 million of shoes, you know? So that's the only other time I've heard a story like this. So that's, that's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> but I also, you know, have been, uh, you know, I think I always started to negotiate hard. So while I still went to school, in Germany, you need to write something that's maybe a bit like a thesis work. So it's a big, complex, scientific paper, so to speak, or publication. And uh, mine was uh, focused on the chaos theory and fractals, and uh, which uh, results in some very sophisticated computer-rendered uh, you know, images. 
And uh, I also published an article in the same uh, publishing agency. And, uh, you know, which is, of course, uh, not really, you know, considered in the system that it would actually go and sell that work. And uh, I negotiated a deal that uh, I would get paid for every one of those colorful images. And, of course, uh, it never made it through to the editor that basically, you know, they had to pay by picture they published and uh, you know they published i think a hundred or so of those because you know just really small but they were so pretty and uh, i ended up also getting a fortune for for this which i think uh, got me in trouble with the school because uh, basically said, okay this isn't like you know what uh, this is uh, meant to be and then I asked them okay show me the rule where i can't and they couldn't find anything so therefore i got away with that and <laughs> um but uh you know, I think that now you may get the impression that um, I was always, um, yeah, very um, maybe aggressive in in my behavior, but it's actually the sheer opposite. I'm the shyest person I know, and I'm totally introvert, so I may not come across like that, which is also not really a he helpful um, characteristics if you start your own company. But uh, you know, eventually over the years, I you know learned to to overplay that, and I can get excited about an idea, and so that um, excitement then um, maybe shields the fact that I'm in fact a shy person. So when I used to go out when I was 14 and 15, you know, I was maybe you know at a bar, or I think maybe in the U.S. would actually go probably at a later age to go out and have a drink, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, this will be low. Yeah, so this is like the disclaimer, but you know, I would stand in the corner with my drink and uh, maybe for three or four hours, I didn't talk to anybody. And then I went back home and, you know, there was no problem because it was just for me normal. And uh, But I guess it's uh, maybe difficult if you want to start a company if you're too shy. So eventually you learn to uh, pretend you're not. But even when I talk to to customers, etc., it's it's always it always requires me to push myself out of my own comfort zone to some extent. And uh, so, I mean, for all those uh, that are out there that think they are shy, don't let that uh, you know be in the way of uh, you know starting a company. And uh, you know, if you if you're just authentic and uh, you know have the ability to to excite yourself about what you do, then that's enough. That's amazing. Where where do you think this uh, part? You know, so it sounds like you're very you're very intu inquisitive and intuitive when it comes comes to things at a young age. Where did this kind of come from? What was your upbringing like with your parents? So um, my dad uh, was uh, you know working in uh, in sales for a tool trade company, and although I never um, worked with him, etc., you know maybe he taught me some philosophies in terms of. Well, you know, you can only spend every dollar once and uh, you either, you know, have to open your mouth or your wallet. And, uh, you know, so which was maybe some philosophical, um, say, um, asset that I basically got, uh, you know, the way I was brought up. And uh, my mother, be, uh, before she became a housewife, uh, basically was a, you know, fashion designer. So an interest in maybe art and design and creativity, you know, is probably more coming uh, coming from that angle and so basically when you point out our our booth i always had uh, more or less the attitude well you know an exhibit booth is going to cost you know a certain amount of money and whether it's ugly or or beautiful um the uh, the cost is about the same and so for that reason just uh, you know, it may as well just look beautiful i completely no, i completely agree and it's fun it's funny you mentioned it earlier i didn't get to comment on it but uh, you talked about the importance of lighting and you know, for me, when I was a when I was a marketing manager a long time ago, you know, I studied some. You know, when I started designing booths, I said I should study some design. So when I left medical school, the one power I had was to learn and educate. So I studied design books, and the one thing they talked about, it, you know, in jewelry and fashion, is the importance of lighting. And so I remember thinking, um, I was like, well, all these booths they spend so much money on making it big, but they don't spend it on lighting, except. Brain Lab always had, uh, I think even to this day, with the exception of a few times, the booth was never a massive one. It was always a 20 by 20, I think, but it was always very, very well lit, you know? And I think as a result of that, it does it, it does something different for the product and, and the experience. Do you feel like that's a big part of the technology is the experience that you have when you're, when you're interacting with it? Um you know, I think so. So, I mean, the same may also be true for, for example, for the company building. So, you know, we are, you know, here headquartered in Munich, and uh, that's where a lot of the R&D work 
takes place. In the meantime, we also have R&D people in uh, basically in Tel Aviv and in uh, San Diego and Chicago and uh, different other places in Ger within Germany. But, uh, you know, here's where the headquarters are and uh, most of our employees work. And uh, we have, I think, you know, what I consider a pretty cool um, headquarter. And um, when we designed it and conceptualized it, I always had this uh, fear that if you get too obsessed by it, then it will turn into your mausoleum. So, you know, how can it be cool, but uh, basically not go overboard? But I also think that it's an expression about the maybe demands you impose on yourself and your products and, you know, also maybe the expectation that you, you know, project maybe on your, on your team. And uh, so we thought, how can that be um, an expression of that, of that demand, so to speak? And uh, I think we did a, you know, pretty cool job. And uh, nowadays we have about a thousand groups of customers that come here and uh, visit us, uh, you know, every year. And, uh, you know, for them, it's basically not just an, about uh, seeing the products and uh, meeting the team and the people, but it also is, I think, a function of the environment that basically creates an experience because I think we're also to some extent selling a intangible product. We don't sell the products you see, but we're also trying to convince people that uh, basically life is short and Brainlab would be exactly the company that you want to work with and uh, use as a foundation um, in uh, in building uh, your career as a as a surgeon, and uh, so for that reason, I think that uh, that has worked uh, quite well. And also, Munich is a quite competitive uh, marketplace. We have a lot of um, uh, American uh, computer companies. Uh, you know, have big headquarters. Sometimes European headquarters here. Um, Apple made a big investment. Uh, you know, IBM. Uh, you know, Intel, Google, um, Salesforce, etc. And uh, so in, uh, you know, fighting for the brightest minds, we need to, of course, be very competitive. And that starts by having Germany's best gym that uh, also includes that we have the best, uh, you know, company restaurant. We have really, um, our, yeah, we have our own pastry chef. We do our own pasta. We serve. Um, I got to come out to Munich. <laughs> Absolutely. Seen, I saw, I saw, you know, I did see a, um, and I, I was hoping you, 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 it was the rest of it was like this because I did see one of the one of your photos you posted on LinkedIn. It was I think in your main hall where you give give presentations and stuff. It's a beautiful hall, very very beautiful. And especially for me, like uh, having a my father is a surgeon and being a medical student. There's a big emphasis on having a a grand surgical operating theater, like where every, the old old ones where people would come in and they would watch a surgery being done. So I saw that hall. I was like, I hope the rest of the company looks like that. That's amazing. Yeah. So. So the, how how long how long have you guys had this headquarter for? Um, we just moved in here about uh, you know five years ago, and there's an interesting story about that because it is the area where the old airport used to be. So the only part that's left from the old airport is um, this big red airport tower, which used to be the control tower um, of the airport. And uh, in fact, I grew up about five uh, you know kilometers from here. So basically, you know. <laughs> I saw the airplanes uh, on final descent uh, just over the house of my parents when they're getting ready to to land. In fact, they're just around that uh, position is where they were putting out the landing gears. And uh, so then also that airport served as uh, basically my gateway to the world. From here, I started uh, to the first business trips uh, you know, of Brain Up. So it's a very interesting trophy to now have uh, taken over this airport tower and we built That's amazing. a 240,000 square foot facility you know, around that. And uh, that has, uh, you know, some very advanced operating rooms where we can show our technology in real action. But it also has this really fantastic, you know, hall, which we can use for town, town hall meetings. But it also turns out that um, we have actually perfect acoustics, like better acoustics than in any uh, Munich, uh, you know, concert hall. And uh, we can um, even if seated, we can fit uh, about uh, 400 40 people in here which is like you know more than some theaters so we have to, actually became a um the innovation partner of the munich opera company and uh you know also work with the munich philharmonic orchestra and uh, we have about uh, you know five six performances uh, you know between the two um uh, you know orchestras or, or companies uh, you know here at uh, at brain lab and uh, so That's amazing. we have really established so you get free that music as, 
<laughs> yeah, so it's not it's not free. We actually sell that officially through basically the ticket sale of the Munich Opera Company. But we're oh, also so looking at this, how this is, a, this is a profit producing service, like for the company. So it's, it's it's for us not a you know profit producing uh, you know service, but the tower is because right. the interesting right. part was that uh, basically for about uh, twenty years nobody would know what to do with the airport tower after the airport had moved because it's under special uh, protection as a landmark building and so nobody came up with the right concept and so we have basically some uh, operating rooms a cafeteria but in the top four floors is Munich's coolest party zone which we use of course internally for our after work parties but also we, we rent it out about 20 times a year and it's so expensive that we tell people it's also Munich's most expensive party location but then there's of course people that are completely non-sensitive to that and by renting out it out about 20 times a year what used to be the um, hindering factor in developing this area actually became maybe the most profitable part of Brain Lab. At least for Brain Lab, <laughs> the tower is free because it's completely funded by the 20 events or so per year. That that is, I I love this. I knew I was going to have fun talking to you. Come, and 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 by the way, I I would imagine that could be you know that is that is probably the best definition of a party fund I've ever heard of in my life. That's amazing. Did you ever yeah, think so that as example, a young? Oh, go uh, go ahead, go ahead. So, for example, the Munich, uh, you know, premium concert location is the Munich Olympic Hall. And however, you know, the four floors of our tower have more individual controllable circuits and effects and elements than this whole um, concert hall. So it's really, you know, four floors fully packed with visual effects and LEDs and, you know, great bars. And uh, however, during the day, we use that for yoga classes and uh, basically, you know, there's curtains and different elements so that uh, people sometimes don't even realize that that you know during daytime and at night are in fact the same rooms that's unbelievable did you ever think as a young boy when you see that tower like yeah one day i'm going to run a company i'm going to own that tower what a what a what a wild story yeah i never i never thought uh, that i in <laughs> fact would start a company because you know as i said since i'm like super shy i you know just could never really you know imagine that this would be something that I would end up doing, but um, I'm very persistent and I just wanted to see my ideas and concepts succeed. And that's just what it took. And then I think that the vision uh, grew bigger and bigger. And it's not that the first idea is really what makes you successful as a company. You know, I had an initial idea and then more and more and more. And, uh, you know, this is something that continues to, to grow. And sometimes the problem is that you're just more or less um, caught by your own, um, yeah, say, conceptual mental uh, limitations. And uh, for me, in fact, in, uh, you know, 2019, I, uh, I had this really, you know, interesting um, experience that completely further transitioned and transformed um, the vision of the, of the company, because I also, um, I, I don't only, you know, have an interest in tech, but also in art. And I think that it's important that you equally address the right side of the brain as you do the left side of the brain, especially when the company name is uh, is Brain Lab. So also in this hall, for example, you know, besides music and uh, and, and opera, etc., there's also in uh, and uh, my own art collection with uh, basically some interesting themes and uh, basically also uh, you know say culturally and uh, and, uh, and uh, politically controversial um, you know exhibitions etc and uh, interesting stuff we could talk about that for you know several hours too but I went to see uh, you know the studio of an artist uh, you know it's actually a, a German artist uh, uh, named uh, Anselm Kiefer who basically you know early on in his career moved to France and he has this. You know, for me, it's probably like the most interesting German artist alive, but he has this really incredible compound where there is uh, maybe uh, 25 pavilions and they're connected through, you know, a maze of uh, tunnels. And then there is basically, you know, just caves under the ground that are really, you know, gigantic. And it's like this really huge area. And then um, he has, uh, he was building another building so that he could paint um, a, a painting that's uh, 50 feet tall. And, you know, for me, I thought this is like so completely limitless. He just doesn't accept any boundaries or limitations or whatever. And when I, I mean, for me, it, it felt so intense. I could really even like feel the adrenaline from that visit, you know, even like two weeks after. However, when I came back, I felt 
ashamed. I, I really felt so ashamed for my own limited vision, looking at basically this completely limitless artist who doesn't accept any, you know, boundaries that basically common people, you know, would accept. And so I realized that basically the the the, the limitation of what Brain Lab um, could achieve in its aims is basically just in my head and uh, not really just a function of, uh, you know, anything other than that. And so I think, you know, maybe it sounds like a very obvious thing, but, you know, sometimes we just need some external trigger to basically sometimes really um, grow the vision bigger in our heads and uh, basically really see that we are just limiting our own um, abilities based our, on our limited, uh, you know, thinking. And uh, so basically after I returned from the trip, uh, you know, I think some of my colleagues really just didn't know what hit them when I just came back with all those crazy ideas and uh, basically was much um, less willing to accept any restriction that we would perceive today. But those restrictions in our perception is also the fact why I like to hire a lot of young people. It's not like really anything that I would see as a active discrimination of, say, older people, but I'm looking for maybe people that haven't learned what the limitations are. Mm -hmm. So if you have somebody experienced, they have all the reasons why it can be done. If you have somebody who hasn't have had a lot of experience on what's possible and what's not, then there's a complete, uh, you know, different uh, perception on that. And, you know, therefore things that seem to be impossible can be accomplished by people that just don't know, that don't know any better. I, I love I love that you just said that. And there's so much to unpack there. I mean, see, I'm sitting here in my library speaking to you. And I think that one of my favorite things to read about is things that have to do with psychology in the mind, especially these older books. And I think that the idea of perception is a very, very powerful one. Some of the more older books that talk about these very ancient uh, philosophies of how you perceive things and use your imagination are very, very powerful. And I think that the the biggest thing for a person is knowing that a lot of the things that they haven't attained yet or achieved is not because it doesn't exist out there. It's because there's a limitation, an obstacle or barrier in their mind, whether it's from their childhood or something else, that somehow they've, they've, they've self-sabotaged themselves. I think one of the most powerful things that um, my, my, first, my very, very first business partner a long time ago, uh, he told me something that always stuck in my head. He said, Omar, all the money in the world is out there for you. It's already yours. It's just in other people's pockets. You have to just convince it to give them to you. <laughs> you know, and so yep. when I think of product and launching, that's always what I think of, you know? Yeah, but there's another element to that. And that is uh, basically for every problem you ever had, the solution to that problem always coexists with the problem. And you just need uh -huh. an expansion of your horizon to discover the solution that was always there because, you know, that solution always coexists um, with the problem. And so that's the other reason why we look people, you know, with uh, diversity. You know, I think it's a very, uh, it's such a fashionable term that I almost, um, I'm hesitant to, to use it. But, um, yeah. you know, what, what does it really mean? I mean, we had people that uh, basically started uh, brewery engineering and the right software for brain surgery. You know, we have people that are, you know, have an education as a tailor and they do maybe marketing. So, you know, I think people from different parts of the world with different backgrounds, different skill sets, different views, is really what is, uh, you know, absolutely crucial to discover the solution that's always there. And it also means that it's crucial to um, expose everybody in the company to the problem. For example, mm -hmm. um, we just don't have a hand of, uh, handful of product managers that have basically monopolized the customer relationship by, br by having an attractive headquarters and having a lot of customers that come here and allowing soft engineers to demonstrate their own product or um, people in accounting even, you know, should go to the operating room once a year and see how our technology is basically impacting our customers and their patients so that they can really understand how also their job and their work um, is uh, basically, you know, part of that. And so basically, this is really what I think is also maybe the secret sauce to really lift the complete um, creative potential of the of the entire you know crowd. So, for example, the person that's working on our you know quoting system basically says, well, in um, every one of the systems we ever sold is a little bit of him. And uh, that's I think is a very um, cool or good dis description of. Uh, 
of uh, of that uh, that aspect or that uh, that concept and then the question is how do you like really get um people um you know connected and how do we get them to to talk to each other and so that basically means you need to get a lot of space for informal communication and that's in fact you know also the idea behind uh, why you know we have the best gym and the best restaurant because those are areas where people meet in our gym the idea isn't that we want to provide the convenience of not going to the gym around the corner um, we have actually two objectives to basically um, um, get people to to do things together that maybe you know for work wouldn't necessarily you know in the routine work work together and also that we can activate people that absolutely didn't do any sports at all in their life and uh, so this uh, i think is a much more important uh, contribution as well and um, and then of course there's the level of competitiveness but basically for example in uh, we have so-called small group training of you know five to eight people that work out in the gym with a basically personal trainer and in those small groups we create cross departmental um communication and uh, creativity and that's where the best ideas are born no and i love that i mean it's it's and i'm sure you think of it like this but a lot of what you describe is like you know it's it's based around company culture and collaboration and everything but it's very much down to like a physics formula right you essentially increase the number of interactions that can happen within a day and by increasing the number of, of those interactions you've increased the number of possibilities and outcomes you know and again uh, i think you put it beautifully which is like anytime there's a problem there's always going to coexist the solution to that problem but getting to that i think is going to involve like how many different versions and numbers of interactions can happen before you get to, you know, figuring out that one solution, you know? And I think that too many times um, the, the approach to solving a problem in anything is limited to a small amount of people within a small instant and that's it. And that just, the math doesn't work out that way. Is it, do you, do you think yeah. of it like that too? Yeah, you know, you otherwise are also committing mental incest. You know, if you're like always talking to the same people, that's what we see today every day with social media that we're just that, feeding, you know, what we that, already know and what we want to, uh, to listen to. You described like our entire industry right there, pretty much, which I, no, I completely agree. I completely, and it's funny, you know, it's funny, um, you know, for me, I, I'm very big on the innovation side in terms of like how we think about the psychology of product adoption. And I remember like six, seven years ago, when I was a marketing manager, uh, or I was a head of marketing and looking around, I was like, I was talking to people in our industry. I was like, why, why are we doing it this way? And I started going outside of our industry to other industries and seeing how they're doing it. I'm like, why are we doing it like this in medical devices? And I think that that exposure, yeah. why do you think that is? Why do you think people get stuck in the way that they do things? Um, because I think that people are typically worse um, relative to change. And, uh, you know, I think I know that from myself, you know, because as I, as I mentioned, I'm really, you know, very shy as a person. And so for me, I just got used to, you know, having to push myself out of my comfort zone um, basically 10 times a day. So for me, this is like really routine. And I think that everybody in some way has to basically make an effort to push yourself um, basically out of your own well, comfort zone. And this way they notice they're alive. What was what was what was uh, uh, something you did this week that pushed you out of your comfort zone? Um, I think you know everything that uh, basically involves uh, you know customer involvement. For example, yesterday there was a digital health summit. Uh, you know, in uh, you know just uh, an hour away from Munich, and I was on the panel with a couple of people. I've done it a hundred times, but basically, you know, just you know public speaking and so on isn't just really for me. So mm. and it never comes as a routine, but for that reason, I think maybe I come across as authentic because I just have to like really put an effort, uh, you know, in it, and maybe that's okay. Mm. And uh, I also think that you need to be, um, you need to accept that maybe you're not going to be perfect. And I think that basically it's also maybe the the courage for imperfection. I think is also important because um, I think the um, you know, in fact, I have not hired people that have been too perfect, uh, you know, in the interview. So I'm always looking for something that's a bit off or maybe strange and so on, which basically makes them much more personable. And also, you know, the the fact that they are authentic is basically, um, I think, also more obvious. And I think we need authentic people to build meaningful relationships uh, amongst each other and also with clients and uh, this then um, at the end will also trigger uh, trigger information so um i think it's the same with uh, you know jazz and you know with many like different types of music you know i think it's 
basically this imperfection, which is like really the spice of life, which is important too. And uh, basically, you know, this, um, you know, pushing yourself out of your own comfort zone and you never know what the day will bring and so on is also, also interesting. But I've also tried to um, bring my business to a level where I don't have to necessarily get involved with um, every day to day, you know, little, you know, aspects or in fact, I, there's uh, different parts of the business divisions, regions, markets that I can kind of just leave alone for basically a couple of months, half a year. And I know that, uh, you know, nothing, uh, nothing bad will happen. But this gives me the freedom to basically then seek out areas that I believe are really, you know, interesting where I want to do a deep dive and, uh, you know, zoom in. So I've just seen a, you know, product demo of, uh, you know, something where I didn't like the user interface. And just before um, our conversation, I had a one hour meeting where I talked about three buttons, one hour, three, bu like just three buttons. And we had a philosophical discussion about, you know, how would one, you know, think about it and uh, basically, you know, how do we in the future design buttons and, you know, why do we want buttons at all? Because I'm a fan of no button, you know, I think that, uh, you know, using software should be like watching TV, the, show, the software would just recognize what the audience, uh, you know, wants to do next. And uh, which, of course, isn't always possible, but at least as, a, as an idea, you know, I think is... Uh, maybe a, a good concept and uh, so you know as i said that's why i really just uh, you know have uh, have a lot of fun still with what i'm doing and uh, basically being in charge of the company for uh, 34 years is very you know say unusual the same company and uh, you know as you mentioned i never worked at any other company other than brain lab so everything i learned i learned from the people that i've hired so basically i wouldn't hire anybody um, unless they were better than I was in that particular area. And so that also made it easy to let go because then if they basically took over something, they did it a lot better. So, for example, um, I did accounting all the way through 1995 and, you know, I installed the first of our systems myself. You know, one of the first installations was at a small hospital in China where the neurosurgeon that was supposed to use our product was only 23 years old and um, just finished medical school two weeks before I arrived. So I had to put on um, basically the stereotype head frame, which I had to bolt to the head of the patient where I would have gone to jail in most countries. But basically the customer made clear that unless, you know, we have treated the first patient, there's no transportation back to the airport. So it's amazing what it can do, um, you know, if you, um, yeah, if you, if you have have to but uh so these are you know there's hardly anything in brain lab i haven't done at some point but it's like you know always very cool to see that you know all those other people do you know their work um a lot uh, better and so i think the um I had really the, you know, I feel privileged having worked for the people that I worked over the, you know, 30 plus years. And they have all been my mentors and coaches. And they, you know, have, I, I look for people that are very outspoken and open, you know, where they say, okay, this is wrong, or they heavily disagree with that. And uh, so, you know, sometimes we're having, um, you know, quite interesting um, debates. But, um, you know, for example, I have this, uh, you know, function called management associates, which is typically people out of, um, you know, university, you know, they had maybe one or two years of uh, experience on their job max, but uh, basically they did maybe an MBA or, you know, you know, from different, uh, different areas. And they are here to learn, you know, to work for me on corporate projects. And this way they understand how brain lab works and structures and processes, et cetera. But what they don't realize it's actually for me also the other way around. So they teach me what's basically, you know, new and, you know, what is maybe changing with how people work and think, et cetera, because over 30 plus years, I think the working world is completely changing in the way of how people think and the way people are wired. And, uh, you know, so that is basically for me a great uh, coaching and uh, and mentorship uh, program. And uh, yeah, I think you just need to be open to, to be able to uh, to learn from the, from those other people. So of course, I wouldn't like openly admit it, you know, all the time. <laughs> but you know, I think that here in a you know private conversation, that of course, nobody will hear. You know, I can easily do that. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you. So like, if we go back, you know, you're you, you're you're very introverted. You come from very humble beginnings and everything. Um, Nineteen, you had this best selling book. Take me to how did Brain Lab? How, how did the conception of Brain Lab happen? Well, okay, well, what, because... what was, take me back to that exact day where you had that idea and what was, and more importantly, not the idea that you had, 
the feeling you had when you had that idea? Okay, because writing software for brain surgery isn't what most people, you know, think to be their destiny in life. So um, when I graduated from high school in 1987, um, basically the book uh, that I had, you know, that I wrote and resulted in my being invited by the uh, University of Vienna um, into their neurosurgery department. And uh, they were struggling with some computer graphics, uh, you know, challenges. And I thought that, you know, with uh, the background of the book that, you know, I could uh, probably help them. And that was almost before there were really, you know, powerful computers. They had uh, basically a um, an old CT scanner and big um, silicon graphics workstations that could only calculate 3D objects out of 5,000 triangles. And, you know, they wanted me to write them an editor that would somehow reduce the number of triangles so that, you know, even for a more complex anatomy, it still could be, you know, rendered. And uh, when I went there, I had no, um, no idea you know, what to expect. And uh, on this trip, I saw the first images from, uh, you know, computer tomography and magnetic resonance tomography. And I just had no idea that those images exist, or I hadn't really thought about those images. And um, I really got uh, completely intrigued by the aesthetics and the beauty of those images, but also the fact that they weren't really used for surgery, that people would put up those images in a light box in the corner of the room. And from what they had memorized, they would start surgery manually and uh, kind of just build a map of that anatomy in their mind. So for me, it was clear that software was maybe, you know, the missing link um, to, uh, to, to connect that. And um, I basically, you know, did, uh, you know, after school, my, my mandatory um, army service at, at that time. However... I basically have also, I thought it was like, you know, just a very much um, boring uh, thing at that time. And so basically, um, I also thought through a plot of how we can, you know, escape uh, basically that early on. So I basically wrote a letter um, uh, to the uh, uh, basically a minister of uh, um, of defense. And I basically um, um, submitted it through the chain of command which of course nobody has ever done before and you know nobody knew how to even process it and it like basically more or less um, basically every, everybody thought i'm crazy and uh, basically um, however it uh, you know took uh, two weeks and then i got basically more or less a letter back that i was basically dismissed early on and i kind of just have been able to cut my things short because i described them of what i was going to do and wanted to do for brain surgery and that would have much more impact on society than basically sitting there and cleaning a rifle and uh, so you know there was i think a compelling argument and so then i basically you're very good at making to... compelling arguments by the way i, I think this is a the theme here <laughs> yeah, so you're maybe. introverted but you're but when pushed you can make a very compelling argument <laughs> i i think i typically just leave no doubt that um i will do what i want to so i think that even you know with my parents I think I maybe I was brought up with a strong will. So were you I the, were you that, the old, uh, only only child? How, how many siblings do you have? Um, I have two two younger sisters. Ah, and, so you're uh, the so eldest. I'm, I'm, yes. Ah. And uh, so I think that maybe my parents always gave me you know a sense of being special, maybe in 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 their in their mind, and that always encouraged me to you know somehow fight for what I wanted. And so even later on in sales, you know, I think even if I had no skills or no idea on how to sell something, I kind of just went to the customer with a mindset, you're going to buy my, you're going to buy my product. You just don't know yet, but you will. And mm. I just like never left any, you know, I had no doubt in my mind that that is exactly what will happen. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, any, any resistance was basically just, uh, you know, almost like pointless. But um, so essentially, um, when I've been able to, you know, cut my army service short, I started uh, basically, you know, after, you know, spending maybe six months on, uh, on, on software work, I thought, well, maybe I, sh I still should get a formal education. And I started uh, studying computer science at the uh, Technical University of Munich. But um, after I've already been, uh, you know, getting, uh, you know, been focused on, on engaging in this, uh, you know, really passion of mine, which, uh, you know, 
basically writing some 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 software for brain surgery. Um, I dropped out of college after after 20 days, and by I think by burning the bridges to a reasonable life and career, I had no other chance but uh, to succeed with what I started. And what I actually did is I created an artificial crisis in a way, which I basically deliberately did, you know, a few times, uh, you know, also then uh, throughout my career, because it kind of just forces, you know, the entire you know organization to maybe move in a particular direction, as it did. Um, in my case, and uh, <laughs> you know, um, forced more creativity on uh, driving uh, brain up forward. So, what were the first ideas and product, uh, um, you know, basically that I started? So, um, basically, it was a so-called stereotactic device that was mounted on the patient's head, which is a little bit like a like a sex tent. It's a it's a couple of uh, joints, and uh, you know, it has scales, and you need to calculate in a um, believe it or you know, not. I, and I, I, I should, um, I should grab it. Hold on. I got to show you this. Hold on one second. I didn't think, I didn't think I'd ever live to the moment where this would happen. Oh, there it is. I in fact have a sextant sitting here in my library. <laughs> wow. Okay. Very cool. So and you're, and very, you're the only it's, it's person similar, I've interviewed. to that. Yeah. The only person I've interviewed. I think I've done hundreds of interviews. You're the only person who actually knows what a sextant is. And I have people who come in the library and like, oh, what is that? I'm like, it's a, it's a sextant. Sorry, please continue. That was worth yep. it. The audience, the audience always asks, like, what's that <laughs> thing? On the, I'm like, it's a sextant, guys. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So essentially, it's, uh, it's basically a couple of joints and angles and, you know, which can adjust. And the idea is that you basically, with a couple of adjustments, can basically aim to a particular point in the brain very precisely. However, there was a complex calculation where you needed to read out a few settings right on the CT scanner console and type them into some pocket calculator. And eventually, if you didn't, uh, you know, mistype, then you would get the, you know, angles right and eventually hit the right spot in the brain to basically take a biopsy or place an electrode or um, basically pinpoint this uh, this one location uh, very precisely through a small burr hole. And I thought that that was very um cumbersome and there was no visualization and no control what tissues uh, you know are you um you know um you know, passing through so i wrote some um very um comprehensive uh, you know software myself that would basically allow you to just on the images set a point and set an entry point and it would not only calculate those settings but would actually visualize um, basically in each slice and in a reconstruction what is the tissue you would potentially damage mm. along the way so that you could also optimize that uh, you know a little bit and that's that's amazing so and i gotta ask like did you see something like this at some point like a, did you see a sextant and say we can use something like that for brain surgery how you know how did you come up with this concept especially this is so so long ago in the early 90s Right, so this no, is like, a really you know, wild concept. Yeah, we we didn't we didn't uh, use the sextant. In effect, it was I think first introduced in the you know um, basically at the beginning of the of the twentieth century. So it's uh, really technology that's almost a hundred years old, and right. people used to take some complicated X rays and rulers to you know calculate how to uh, pinpoint uh, this one location in the brain. And uh, basically, there was uh, basically two or three companies that built the mechanical device, but they didn't have any software to actually, you know, hit that. And how, we wanted to. How yeah. are you, how did you? This is so so long ago because this this is not cheap to do. It's not like today, like it's easier to stand up a company. Back then, it took so it took a lot of money to do this. How did you how did you get the initial capital? to create and like commercialize your first product. Don't well, tell me the book know, sales. That would be, that would make this amazing. Was it the book sales? Yeah. So, um, oh, fundamentally seriously? life. Yeah. So life, life, life was cheap. I was living in the, uh, um, in my parents, uh, you know, basement. So, and writing software for brain surgery, not what most people, you know, basically think of their firstborn to, to do. And while everybody else was going to university, got a real job, et cetera. So, you know, that's, that's what I did, but as I said, like I always had a very strong um, will, and uh, so the seventy-five thousand dollars really, you know, um, carried me through, you know, these the first, uh, you know, couple of years, 
Um, I really thought that uh, this one company, you know, the, the name was Radionics. Um, I can say that the company doesn't exist anymore, nor do the founders. And uh, basically, you know, they built this mechanical, you know, device. And uh, I thought, okay, I can have the software. They can help, um, you know, to sell that. However, you know, they really um, used the idea to more or less um, solicit and create some interest while they were trying to copy that and build their own software. Uh. And so basically, you know, as I said, I never wanted to really have a company. I just wanted to see my technology to succeed. And I thought that they would just go and sell it. And I've been uh, basically traveling around, uh, basically, you know, paid by them to basically talk to customers. And they only generated leads. And then basically while they were developing their own solution. And uh, basically this, uh, by the way, this, uh, you know, stereotactic targeting is something we still do today, but today is less than 1% of our revenue. So basically, you know, you can also see that not necessarily just the first idea is what will basically be sufficient to build a sustainable um, uh, business. And uh, so basically they, um, Radionics uh, developed its own product while uh, basically they, um, you know, more or less kept me to keep some interest in the marketplace. And uh, that product now the sudden uh, became uh, or got launched in uh, 1992. So uh, basically just five years after I graduated from high school. So most of the money that I made with the book was gone, maybe except about $10,000. And uh, so, yeah, so that probably would have been a very smart point in time to just give up and uh, focus on uh, doing something else. But giving up wasn't really the right thing for me so why, why I, though because because everything everything back then at least logically objectively it's like hey you know five years after you 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 graduate high school you go on this wild journey you sell a book you know you get seventy five thousand dollars, which is a lot of money back then your parents allow you to pursue this idea in their basement you've run out of money it didn't work out everything says like hey you know what this is great stefan but you should probably go back to school like, why why didn't you do that because I just hated university, you know, I think it wasn't the right thing for me. It was like, you know, structured and, you know, I've already gotten used to basically making my own money. And then, you know, I just, you know, it wasn't the right thing for me. And then also uh, the, uh, you know, I've been through some other interesting um, basic episodes too, because basically it wasn't so completely easy to also, um, you know, just uh, work out the fight with the University of Vienna, because I really just learned from them, you know, what CT and MRI images are, you know, I delivered my project, which was a data preprocessor, you know, and uh, after that, um, they basically started to claim ownership rights for what I did. And so they basically, you know, I got a letter from the Austrian government, basically more or less threatening me to um, to, to, to sue me and taking me to court. So it's an interesting trophy as a 20 year old to be um, sued by the was, basic. In was radionics an Austrian company? No, it's a, it's a company based in, in, in Boston. So I'm talking about the university of Vienna. Oh, Vienna. So they basically, oh, wow. So, and so it's, it's basically, okay. they, they are basically how, how a, a, threatening to a, sue you. <laughs> yeah. So it's an organization, um, under the, you know, ministry of, uh, of science. And so basically the Austrian government basically more or less sent me a, you know, basically cease and desist letter and basically, you know, more or less, uh, you know, uh, were, you know, was getting ready to take me to court. And, uh, you know, it was already even to the point where the court hearings, uh, you know, were, were scheduled. And how, uh, how old were you, by the way? 20. So how, it's also how, an inter how are your parents handling this just at the time? I, I didn't I gotta... tell them. I didn't tell them. <laughs> Smart. <laughs> That's that's why you were able to manage it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so how did how I, did that thought, feel coming home? Your parents like like oh Stefan, how was how's your day? It's like oh it's good, and then you back your mind. You're like I have the Austrian government sending me a cease and desist, but other than that, everything's fine. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that I like skiing. I you know enjoy going to Austria, but maybe I just have to go and ski in Switzerland uh, moving forward. And uh, you know, which was of course a bit of a naive uh, you know view. But um, I was convinced that I was right. And I think that being right, you know, I would also prevail. And so I think the, you know, legal fees are probably not as expensive, you know, here. I actually didn't have, I never even took a lawyer at that point. And, uh, but, you know, I think that, you know, it was just uh, more or less a bluff on their part. And uh, I think they um, more or less, uh, you know, backed out, uh, you know, just three days before the first court hearing. And um, basically that uh, didn't really 
you know, result in a very cozy relationship with uh, basically the University of Vienna. And it basically almost like took um, 20 years to kind of just recover and uh, basically get back to that. But, you know, back to your question. I mean, so there was another thing that uh, that I had basically more or less uh, um, gotten at that point. And my attitude was always that, you know, with all those experiences, this is something that nobody could take away from me. Something that basically, you know, you couldn't pay, you know, with money. And it's an experience that, you know, how can you, you know, ever even, um, you know, just get something similar in just a few years with any other effort. So for that reason, it's always worthwhile to try to start your own business, uh, you know, basically no matter what. So basically, it was, in fact, a really stupid idea to write software for uh, brain surgery because a neurosurgeon that needed software wasn't a good neurosurgeon 30 years ago. Fortunately for Brain Lab, you know, times have changed. And in fact, you know, also there weren't really any computers at that time. So um, Windows uh, 3.1 came out uh, basically just a few years later, the Pentium chip, etc. So the first computer that I used was in fact a Commodore Amiga, which was basically considered a gaming console. So which of course, you know, people didn't think that that would look too serious. So I basically um, took the front panel, I unscrewed the front panel and basically had a local machine shop and machine another different looking front panel out of solid aluminum. So it looked really super high. And in fact, it was much nicer than um, the um Yeah, that would Amiga. make it look really nice. I know, I, know which, yeah. I know which model you're talking about. That would make it actually look really nice, to be honest. Yeah, because it was brownish and we gave it a different color. Yeah, it looked color. really so ugly. So in fact, it looked very much, it looked almost like very similar to how later on, you know, some of the, um, uh, the Apple, um, you know, computers looked like. And uh, so then, uh, you know, the problem was also that I want to make sure that if people opened the motherboard that it didn't like, you know, it wasn't Amiga all over. So I basically put stickers on every chip and, uh, you know, the motherboard, etc. So then this was the um, basic brain scan workstation. And, uh, you know, so however, you know, I pretty much had run out of money, you know, in uh, 1992, I had, a, you know, formidable competitor that just received FDA clearance, the FDA just imposed new guidelines on uh, software control devices in October of, uh, I think, 1991. And uh, basically, I had no customers, they sold like immediately the product to 10 clients, and I had just like hardly any money and nothing. So what did I do? I built an exhibit booth in my parents' house garage. Um, I, um, you know, at that time, I didn't have much material. So that's where, you know, the focus on light um, originated. Um, I, you know, checked about 850 pounds of luggage on a flight to the U.S. Well, you know, the building I'm in right now still was the airport. Um, I told the airline that I'm a student and this is my thesis work to basically talk myself out of paying for um, excess luggage. I love and, this. <laughs> and 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 this was basically in uh, you know the uh, the Congress of Neurological Surgeons in Washington D.C. So That's a great basically, Congress. it's a great yeah, Congress. So, so we we basically uh, you know couldn't afford to uh, basically stay in the city. We stayed at a Motel Six in uh, you know Laurel, Maryland, for um, at that time it was eighteen dollars ninety five. We had uh, basically breakfast at, I believe, Shoney's for $3.49, which was so bad we didn't need to eat anything for the rest of the day. And uh, then basically um, we had a car that we ser reserved through Avis and we had made a booking with uh, free miles, but for some reason they couldn't find the right uh, you know, reservation key. So, you know, we disconnected the wire of the meter to basically get ourselves the free mileage. And uh, basically also, you know, we were supposed to set up the exhibit booth and pay for union labor, which we also couldn't afford at the time because it was $69 an hour. So basically we were, waited, uh, we were waiting in the restroom um, basically until they locked up the exhibit hall for the night. And then we set up the exhibit um, booth, uh, you know, ourselves in the dark. And, uh, you know, I, I took my, you know, my sister along with me because I said, well, you know, need to be more bodies, uh, you know, just on the exhibit um, floor. And uh, basically when the exhibit opened, we were there with a flashy booth like most of our competitors. And as a result of that, we got the first um, sales, not as you may think, um, basic customers in Germany, but in uh, basically North America, in uh, Taiwan, in uh, basically South Africa. So Brain Lab immediately was a global company for a market that really didn't exist in the niche of a niche. But, uh, you know, eventually today, fortunately, you're not a good neurosurgeon if you um, don't use software for 
uh, you know, most procedures. In fact, you could almost like say you're not a good neurosurgeon if you don't use software from Brain Lab nowadays. That is unbelievable. And I got I just got to recap that back because I love these are the kind of stories. This is why I started the show, by the way, is to hear stories like that, which is essentially like you took a huge bet on yourself and you believed you had unwavering belief. And then more the most important part that especially for the people who are product and marketers listening is that you went and launched a non-existent category in a market that didn't exist, which is the right yeah. thing when it comes to innovation. I think a lot of times too much, especially in the startup world, we think about disruption. When you disrupt, you're essentially dealing with the same market, the same pieces. But true innovation means you leave all of that and you go to a completely blue ocean, right? Where you have no idea what's out there. And then you launch something and then there's going to be a few of those you know, true believers or early adopters. Who are some of those early, I guess, early adopters and really true believers of Brain Lab in the early days that really helped make the company who it is today? So I think it was uh, maybe the first sales were like really, you know, partial. So there was basically, you know, just a, a neurosurgeon at uh, Morton Plant Hospital in Clearwater, Florida, you know, basically, um, you know, we sold maybe the first really, you know, complete system. Um, at uh, you know to uh, to Albany Medical Center, so you know they wanted to really. It was a complex radio surgery system for uh, using focused radiation in uh, in, in uh, you know for treatment of brain tumors, and uh, basically at that time we really were quite successful with the um, help of the um, um, you know administrator to almost convince them, and then basically more or less the competition at that time still Radionics um, came back and basically says. Um, Brain Lab doesn't have a target position, which was like one component um, that uh, basically, you know, they were right, we didn't have one. And I say, what an insult, you know, to basically say we don't have a target position. Of course, we have, you know, basically advice that can help you to, you know, correctly position the patient. And then I say, well, you know, I think that I'm sure that you can um, maybe send us a picture of that. And say, uh, yeah, I'll send like you know, I just let, let me get a good picture, and like I'll send you something tomorrow. And I say, okay, crap, like how, um, you know, I have I had no idea what to send because advice didn't exist. So basically, I took my Commodore Amiga and basically, said, okay, I'm going to do a 3D rendering with one of the most sophisticated ray tracing, uh, you know, software programs, and I basically have. Um, more or less now time to think about how would I solve the problem of positioning a patient. And so far, it was very similar to the sextant system, like you had a set of scales, etc. And, you know, but basically it was for me too complicated to basically build a 3D object that had all those little scales because I would sit there for, you know, days and days and days. But, you know, I pretty much thought that I have about maybe 13 hours to basically build the object and then it needs about eight hours to you know render the image and then need to fax uh, you know the the picture that was at the time of faxes there wasn't really email and um so i i, I sat down and said okay i'm going to take a box a plexiglass box and i'm going to print um the sheets that have the exact coordinates which of course would be much safer because i then established a um, a reference uh, grid on the on those boxes and i print them i can actually print the exact position of the tumor so that you have some visual control and i will show the entry beam of the of the of the of the um of the radiation beam where the uh, treatment is starting so that is a complete independent redundant check that the entire setup is correct because it checks almost like five things at the at, at, at once and that basically there were no other errors along the way and i basically sat all night uh, to uh, basically render that i went to bed at five o'clock in the morning started the computer to uh, render the image with it at that time took you know six seven hours and in the morning i basically took a look at the 3d rendered picture i printed it with a dot matrix printer and i faxed it and customer was delighted say what a cool concept you know why didn't you show us that in the first place and i built the device and shipped it within six weeks and that became almost like the benchmark for the market and uh, three years later you know radionics adopted exactly and copied exactly you know what we had um you know created so basically you know i've, I've been really you know quite uh, um inventive uh, you know at that uh, at that early time but um, basically then, of course, 
when you want to grow the business, um, basically, you know, this all, you know, continues to cost money. So, you know, I think as you know, that you know, earlier, the money from the book eventually was gone. So every time I wanted to spend something, I calculated, okay, how much money do I need? And then I basically, you know, looked at, okay, which customer is going to pay me that exact amount. And I went to this customer really, as I said, with this mindset, this, I'm going to sell him this product and he doesn't know yet, but you know, he will buy my product. And, you know, mostly, you know, they did. And uh, however, you know, I think hospitals are late to pay very often. So when the company was basically getting to about, let's say, um, uh, you know, $5 million of uh, business, you know, we also had probably $5 million uh, of accounts receivable. And uh, yeah, uh, this was also before venture capital was even available. I didn't even know the term. And basically also in Germany, there isn't such a thing like, you know, personal bankruptcy that you could file. So basically, you know, if something goes wrong, you're going to pay for the rest of your life. Um, basically, you're going to be enslaved by the banks. So, um, and it's actually not even so easy to get a loan for, you know, 5 million with basically nothing. So basically, I went to the local savings bank and I, you know, basically I've been able to convince the banker to just give me a loan. And I personally guaranteed, you know, I think it was going up to, you know, basically 80 times my, you know, as the um, business grew, I had to also the guarantees went up to 80 times, 80 times my annual net salary, which, of course, you know, I think once it goes be, be beyond uh, 10 or 20, you know, it kind of just really doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. So basically nobody's going to work, work um, you know, I think at that time I would have needed to work until I'm, you know, 103 or so years old, which is like very unlikely. And even with advances of te um, in technology and, uh, you know, but I was really fearless, you know, today I would say stupid, but, you know, I felt fearless. And, you know, of course, another thing I didn't tell my parents. <laughs> Just un. This is, you know, I knew that I was going to have a great conversation with you today, but had had I known it would be anything like this, I probably wouldn't have slept last night. Actually, I didn't sleep last night much because I was I was pretty excited because I'm like, because again, the biggest thing is like this guy's been in his own company for over 30 years now. He's he doesn't know anything else. I was like, there's going to be some interesting stories. I didn't think it'd be like this though. That is unbelievable. And you know, it kind of it kind of explains your um your philosophy when it comes to hiring, which is you know. It's it's not like an aging. It's more of like you want to hire people with very interesting, diverse backgrounds. But more importantly, the, there's this lack of experience that that allows you to have not no gauge on your limit and you go beyond it. And it's kind of yes. sounds like that's that's why a lot of this like had you tried to do brain lab later on in life, it probably wouldn't have happened because you, you would have had you'd have had all these biases already built up in your head, you know, and these limitations yep. of perception and imagination. And I think back then because of your uh really your imagination and i think the fact that that there's a there's this concept of imagination where you can manifest things into reality as so as long as you're able to really like deeply experience it in your on your own body and your imagination and it sounds like from the conception of your products to selling of the customers it's like you already saw these things happening before they happened and so for you to take action and maybe fail but try again like that that was just part of it's almost like a plane taking off from one point a to point b you're going to get to point b even if there's some turbulence do you feel like that was a big part of it yeah yeah for sure but i think it's mostly really the privilege of uh, being surrounded by the people that i've just uh, um you know hired for 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 brain lab so um you know, I think a lot of entrepreneurs hire people that are maybe a little minimies of themselves. Yeah, maybe that's true. genetic clones with a small genetic defect, so they can't quite, you know, get up to the level of uh, basically their boss. And uh, you know, this uh, really, uh, you know, incredibly smart group of people was really, you know, what's driving the success. So I personally not really responsible and can't take credit for like you know, all those uh, you know cool things we do. I'm trying to more or less become maybe the sounding board and, you know, more or less stimulate maybe a new thought or direction here and there. Um, you know, for example, you know, we have something that we call, you know, our bus system. The first name of the first generation was Digital Lightbox. It's a big touch display that I felt, you know, we want to have a really interactive gateway for surgeons to manipulate and work with data. And the way of how we came up with that was I saw the movie Minority Report where Tom Cruise manipulates uh, you know crime in the future and i thought this is what we want for uh, for surgery 
So I uh, gave a DVD to one of my best project managers. I said, okay, here's a you know, budget of a million dollars. You have 18 months. That's uh, what I want you to develop. And uh, basically we launched uh, you know, the digital light box um, in um, you know, early um, um, 2006. And uh, that was uh, basically six months before the iPhone got introduced. And then, of course, everybody who saw it um, you know, because it had multi-touch and, you know, most of those elements. So this is like the iPhone. And I was very upset. But uh, because, <laughs> but I mean, the cool thing is that everybody intuitively, you know, just knew how to use it and uh, nurses and uh, technicians and everybody who would walk up to the system just needed no explanation. And that was really part of the success where now the device is in um, thousands of uh, operating rooms. And uh, this is, uh, you know, just uh, an example. I'm sure that also, you know, Apple probably took the idea from uh, Minority Report. And, uh, you know, although this, I still believe, is uh, um, a very cool device that I typically love uh, demoing to, to customers, I still do a lot of uh, customer demos myself because I think you shouldn't buy software from very a company important. where the CEO can't even give a decent demo, you know, himself I, or herself. Stefan, you have no idea how much I, I agree with this, with that philosophy. Please, yeah, continue. I agree completely. <laughs> Yeah. Yes. So, you know, while we have this really cool product, we're also basically in the process of uh, basically just uh, a little bit uh, blowing up that market, you know, as well. You know, we, we created something we call Bus Virtual because... Um, and this, this is your physical... digital, that's your digital OR vision, correct? Exactly. So that's like, you know, part of it, so to speak. But the digital OR vision is, uh, you know, a little bit... And those big screens um, basically are expensive. You know, they cost plus minus, uh, you know, seventy to eighty um, thousand dollars. And uh, basically, with software, maybe a bit more. And uh, a lot of times, the sales cycles are five years because you know you need to you need to wait till they have some architectural project and engineering and uh, approvals and you know take the um, OR down to get it installed, etc. So you know, waiting five years for me is a little bit like watching paint dry. So um, I'm just way too impatient. So I say, this is just not working for me. We need something else. And uh, so we came up with uh, now what we call Bus Virtual. But when we developed it, it had the code name BrainLab TV. Because a little bit like Apple TV, it's a small mm. box that basically you can plug into the video chain. In fact, you can hijack any existing screen in any OR. I, I, played, just... I played with the product, actually, at, at, oh, at cool. your booth. It was very cool. Yeah, it was. It was very. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. I'll remember the the product manager's name, but yeah, it was a great demo. I really enjoyed. Please, yeah, yeah. So we can plug that in, and so we can basically t stream and record and send that video signal somewhere else. But also, we can have any software running on a server that we now can basically bring to the screen. So it could be a screen where the competitive product was just installed a month ago, or it could be a you know, say, a ten year old. A GE 9800C arm with you know, almost like a tube monitor, and we can still basically take over that screen and bring some additional overlay, some additional intelligence, some um, maybe AI-based labeling of uh, of anatomy, etc. You know, to this device. So we basically are really able to uh, you know go into existing legacy um, infrastructure and uh, you know take that over, and so. Basically, that was for me, you know, just something that now the sudden gives a much broader access to uh, to what the market can do. Absolutely, yeah. and, and you know, I think Stefan, the other thing that I loved is that this is something that helps. You know, it's not just an incremental improvement; it's it's a big improvement for 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 surgery, but without like adding a bunch of costs. Like you're taking over legacy products, which is fantastic. And by the way, I remember the name of the person who's a marketing manager, Anjali Patel did a fantastic job. And again, like I always notice that brain lab, there's a lot of um, consistency with the people that I meet, which is they're always very curious, passionate about the products. And no matter who I, you know, get a demo from over the, you know, the last 10 or 12 years ago to brain, it's always like at the highest point, Angeli did this amazing job when she was uh, walking me through this. And I remember watching and I'm like, and it's funny you mentioned that I didn't say it at the booth. Cause I was like, I don't know how they're going to feel about this, but I thought I was like, oh, this is like Apple TV, but for surgery, this is, this is great. Cause it, and again, I asked, I was like, oh, does this, do you have to buy uh, the monitors? He's like, no, no, this is just like plugs in wherever you want to like see products, which is great. You know? Yeah. And so, um, this was really, you know, just 
key, but we have now just started to almost like develop a complete new generation of operating system um, around it, which uh, basically you know, has a couple of key um, you know attributes. So first of all, you know we um, are creating a very uh, say elaborate uh, dataverse almost like around that, you know, because all those systems are generating data. And I think that you could say in healthcare, the challenge over the last 30 years was how can you provide a better treatment, ideally at a lower cost or both. I think the challenge for the next 20 years in healthcare will be how can you provide an adequate treatment at all with the um, basically you know more and more limited resources that uh, basically are going to be available and uh, basically in germany for example 20 percent of the hospital beds can be filled because there's just not enough nurses and uh, etc and i think this is becoming a global problem so in the past we used to steal them from poland and india etc but you know i think those now you know emerging markets are also not uh, you know having enough um, resources and uh, you know this is really becoming a global um, you know problem in you know, almost like the entire service industry, but basically healthcare is probably even a little, a little bit more critical. So basically you need to have ways of how we can automate, uh, you know, documentation and how we can enable people to do uh, basically safely procedures that are more complex than what they would uh, like normally be, you know, qualified to do, but do it even better and safer than somebody who had maybe five years more um, experience. And so uh, basically we will have, um, you know, on the one hand, we looked at uh, you know what's happening with all all the data that's being generated and it's not really used so people um you know collect data that's from billing and uh, basically more or less all those systems that are in uh, you know hospital systems but uh, basically what about registries and data in a broader sense so there is uh, globally there are 42 knee and hip registries where they collect uh, you know more or less a and, and upload from an Excel spreadsheet with a dozen settings on maybe what's the angle and the size of this, uh, you know, hip implant. And it's, uh, of course, very difficult to derive a better guidance for, you know, what should that surgery look like? And um, so we have, and it's mostly small companies with two or three people. They don't scale nationally and certainly not internationally. And we have basically, you know, over 200 people for a couple of years now uh, focused on how we create this data ecosystem that uh, would basically globally work because you could say digital health isn't an area that's you know completely claimed especially in surgery from either an american or chinese uh, mega platform yet and mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's an ideal or interesting area to claim because basically google has almost uh, you know say restarted the google health initiative for the fourth or fifth time because it's very difficult to take, you know, what they do and generalize it uh, globally because um, all the healthcare systems are so different. So we have our technology in 6,300 hospitals in uh, basically 120 countries. We consider about 7,000 hospitals doing a serious surgery. So we are 90% of all the hospitals digitally entrenched. So we have a very good understanding of basically the constraints and limitations um, in each market. And uh, basically Europe has the... Uh, GDPR requirements for patient and data privacy, which are really tough. And Germany is probably the most uh, awkward, but also most difficult implementation of that. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> therefore, being a German company is probably not where you would think it makes sense to invest in this. But however, if we can get it done in Germany, we can, you know, generate from that a European solution. And that is more suitable to turn into a global solution. So I think we can really create a... Um, a hybrid from cloud-based and on-prem, uh, you know, systems that basically will have centralized and decentralized approaches and uh, basically, uh, you know, um, prompts that uh, questionnaires we can send to patients and um, AI extraction from images and uh, and really build a s several registries in different countries. And, uh, you know, so for any other medtech company, we have now the sudden the repository for where that uh, that uh, that could be could be put. And um, then in order to feed that uh, basically data stream, um, obviously surgery is like the most uh, analog thing in in healthcare. And uh, so, you know, if you want to really detect different steps and different scenes, that's what a lot of companies are focused on. But I think that uh, there's like some, uh, there's two problems. First of all, for example, they're trying to see how we can you set a suture and now you detect that this is what's going on. 
But, um, you know, first of all, you need to know where does it fit in in the continuum of 27 steps um, of that procedure. So you need to know you're now at step 17 and now it's 18A and B and here's where it branches off. And, uh, you know, also in addition to the video um, uh, data, you would also need to have a location. So similar to autonomous driving cars, you know, if they see the um, the video picture of your um, of your um, road intersection, that's not good enough if you don't also have the GPS coordinates of that. So that's what, uh, you know, we bring to the table. And so we are starting to really build a very elaborate, uh, you know, framework also of surgical workflows that basically will be detected by this, uh, basically, um, you know, bus virtual by this digital OR systems so that you have a better log of all the different steps um, along the way. So now getting um, real data from surgeons is tough, you know, so basically a lot of surgeons right. don't want to have a surveillance camera um, basically yeah. watch them during surgery the whole time and then hand it over to BrainLab so that we can develop software and we would need to get that from thousands of surgeries. What if one little piece changes now the sudden you have to like throw away 10 years of uh, labeled uh, videos and start all over to train your ai algorithms so what we started to do is we've also acquired a company um called level x out of um uh, chicago I'm, that does yeah, basically I'm speaking with them great great company too by the way yeah, so they do basically, you know, computer games for surgeons. So basically over a million surgeons are already playing their games. And it's, uh, you know, super realistic uh, tools that use the latest um, computer graphics tools from and, and mechanisms from the oh, gaming industry. The, the light bulb just went off in my head. Please, yeah, continue. And, 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 and also, uh, basically, he, it, it, it uses um, the, um, the concept of frustration and reward with dopamine release to basically have an accelerated learning experience. Right. So it's basically doing some growth hacking. So basically, we, we can help the, um, the accelerated adoption of a technology, which is, I think, for us, a big um, it's a business to business approach. And we're basically working with most um, med tech companies, for example, even for NASA, we're developing uh, basic simulation and training tools for for deep space, uh, you know, missions. But what this technology or this framework also does, it creates for us some sort of uh, digital uh, surgical metaverse that basically allows us um, to generate synthetic video data in any variation where in this uh, framework, I just change one little knob, one little you know, component, and I can re-render you know, an infinite number and of different video sequences and retrain my, my algorithms. So I we really have say, this- yeah. you know, I was going to say, and that's 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 now it makes sense. I was thinking, I was thinking about that back when when I first saw the acquisition happen when Brain Lab acquired Levels. I'm like, why do they want to do that? And it kind of hit me, and I was, I'm, ha I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I'm this very interesting that you said that, which is essentially the issue with the data issue, right? If you're doing it in real time, you might do like 50, 100 cases in a month or three months, but when you take it virtually and you gamify it. You can do 100 cases in a day, and so you solve that data problem that you need because AI needs infinite data in order to train the algorithms and improve on it. And so a lot of these things in terms of the knobs and the adjustments, through the gamification, you can change it and then have that update done within like a week because of the, the, the influx of, 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 of you know, practicums and surgeries. Plus, you get into the education side, which is like residents and fellows and stuff. Yes, we are we're planning on doing a complete residency in spine just completely digital so basically oh, you know I think that's that in bits and pieces so you know i am i'm really you know we're shattering um basic residents and look at what did they you know what was the hard, the the hardest problem for them to understand in the last month and how can we turn that into a computer game and because gamify sometimes it. Exactly, because sometimes you have to do a hundred procedures and then procedure number 107. And all of a sudden you come across this one uh, maybe special situa situation and say, okay, now I get it. This is what it's all about. And so what we can do is we can actually move it up. We can make sure that it doesn't take you 107 cases, but maybe case seven is like this really um, you know, mind-boggling uh, you know, um, effect where you say, okay, now I understand um, what this is for and uh, where the benefit of this technology really, you know, is. And uh, so this, um, you know, capacity or this trick allows us to be a lot more, um, 
uh, effective in training, but then also, you know, there's the computer can play, um, you know, with itself. So we can basically generate an infinite number of um, camera angles, lighting situations, and different patients variations to basically train, uh, you know, AI. And uh, mm -hmm. so that, of course, will then will feed our, our our data infrastructure in a way that uh, that that can be really um, you know quite unique. And mm -hmm. I think what this will really do is it's now the sudden addressing a broader market beyond the verticals that BrainLab is addressing itself, like in spine, in brain surgery, in radiotherapy, etc. Because now the sudden in almost like any surgical subspecialty, we create an operating system for surgery on which you can build your own applications on top. And uh, basically you can say that maybe the uh, medical industry didn't have its Tesla moment yet. So, you know, all the, you know, companies uh, are somehow thinking in silos. They think that they yes. somehow will have enough uh, um, skill set to build their own digital system, but they're using software not to, um, um, as it's uh, intended with unlimited scalability and interoperability, but instead they're trying to um, uh, create a proprietary system and add maybe a special feature that only they control to and, their and, proprietary closed yeah, system. And the adoption is not going to happen because these hospitals aren't stupid. I completely agree. Stefan, we're, I, you have to go soon, but, yes. but I'm going to try and hold you a little bit longer. Can you, can you answer one more question? Sure. You sure? Okay. But I'm going to let you more. Okay. A few more. I, I'm going to take it. I mean, look, my audience, my audience is, is, is going to love, is going to love this. I know them very well, but I will say that a lot of this episode, we talked about history. I'm going to have you back. We're going to talk about the future, but I do have one question for you. Yeah, I'm going to let you pick. This is kind of like, you know, those books, pick your own adventure. I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you pick your own adventure. This is the last one. So either I want you to tell me about an incident at Brain Lab, which was like a major turning point, perhaps something that didn't get as much attention as it usually should, right? That's adventure number one. Adventure number two, what was one failure you had to go through and that you and what did you learn from it and how did that shape how brain lab operates today so those are the two adventures you can go on you have to pick one or if I you want to i think they're very related so yeah you know, um, okay perfect and and ultimately i think there was uh, as an entrepreneur you have to have a lot of your dark nights of the soul i think it's like mm -hmm. a lot of times the lonely moments where, you know, you always get a lot of good advice and a lot of people that have an opinion, but at the end, you need to, you know, then make decisions all, you know, on your own. For example, we're about to IPO in uh, basically, you know, 2000. We were actually the last company to withdraw from the, you know, German, uh, you know, tech market before it completely, you know, collapsed. And uh, basically at that time, you just never quite know what's going to happen. And uh, basically, you know, that's where um, it's always hard to tell. But, you know, as you can see for BrainUp, that was a good thing. And uh, basically there were a lot of, um, you know, interesting uh, questions, uh, you know, around that, for example, you know, how do you keep uh, maybe the, the banks that give you loans from not pulling uh, the plug? So, you know, our first, uh, you know, listing was slotted for July 5th. Um, of, uh, I think, was it 2000 or 2001? I almost forgot. And so basically, um, the, um, and the, uh, um, and I had to, we finished the roadshow on July 3rd. And this was like one of the lonely moments where basically you can ask a lot of people, but at the end of the day, you have to also live with the consequences without knowing what they are going to be. So I got in front of the people on July 4th. And, uh, you know, I think I was ready to cry, but that wouldn't be a great, uh, you know, vote of confidence or a sign of confidence, uh, you know, for the employees. And uh, so I started talking about how cool the roadshow was and my experience. And then I had the, um, you know, the key idea, you know, with around July 4th and said, oh, by the way, tomorrow you're all invited to our independence party because we had already booked the IPO party. We couldn't cancel it. We would have still needed to pay it fully. And also for the employees, they didn't know quite what to make out of the fact that we would have pulled the plug on an IPO. Is it good? Is it bad? What does it mean? So by since I announced it's a party, um, you know, that sent the message, okay, it's a great thing to happen. And, you know, I called it independence party. So basically July 4th gave me this uh, this idea, you know, on the spot. And it was really this instantaneous spark that basically, you know, created this, uh, you know, I hadn't really thought about it. I just basically made it up, you know, as I went. And um, the um, and then, of course, a lot of the bankers came 
and uh, because they didn't know what what to make out of it and why would Brainup do a party if, you know, about a canceled IPO. And what I did is I basically you know created plaques like golden plaques for you know say the Mind Vision Action Award for long time uh, support of the company. And uh, basically I asked you know one banker after the other you know on stage I gave them that award for the continuous support. Um, of the company and then made sure that you know some of our employees with their you know wives and kids you know came up to them and also thanked them personally so i made it completely emotionally impossible for any of them uh, to pull the plug on us at the time and uh you know there i think there is never um there's never a right or wrong solution and there's never a complete disaster you know you need to even if you you know fall down with a bleeding nose get up and you know keep walking and make sure that the you know, I think there's also never a right or wrong decision. You need to make sure that the decision that you took ends up uh, being um, being the right uh, the right decision. And I think this is maybe the, the the important part. And I would also say sometimes we get mentally mentally stuck with our plan A. If we would give a plan B a little bit more love, then that can sometimes be um, a lot cooler. So I think there's really you know the the, the power of the plan B that I would encourage you know every Buddy, to once in a while to uh, maybe you know spend a bit time you know thinking about and uh, you know for example another thing that I could think of we launched a, you know product called um, Colibri which was a really tiny navigation system and uh, basically we had an advertising campaign that that was basically a cheap navigation system discount uh, I remember um, this. trainer navigation and it was a complete disaster I mean it was like really terrible. Because basically, you know, neurosurgeons uh, that, you know, have some self-esteem, they don't want a cheap system. So, in fact, they want a very expensive system and it looked cheap and it was, you know, silver and it looked like a little tin toy and so on. And it was just terrible. And so basically what we did is we like changed the color, we changed, we made it white and, uh, you know, the color scheme. We it looks put it much on better now. Card, <laughs> and uh, basically then this, uh, you know, we launched it and we are added a little keyboard and you know we fixed it so basically were a number of things where we just took something and we fixed it and there were also interesting um marketing fights and ideas that we had throughout the years for example um you know we're always called the stereotactic kindergarten so people basically says okay brain lab is no i think it started with uh, basically we wanted to just really launch a product that um, basically which was a new um uh, uh, vector vision squared system at the time but we didn't or i think it was some new um you know uh, generation and we didn't have it ready yet we couldn't show a picture and we basically had a uh, you know a guy in a bunny costume walking uh, through the desert and we did an ad and called it unlocking possibilities and of course it was a scandal you know why would somebody do you know such a such an um, ad in a in a in a journal and, uh, you know, and then they called us, you know, as childish, we're the um, basically a stereotactic kindergarten, you know, stereotactic surgery was like, you know, this category we're called the neurosurgical kindergarten, so to speak. And I say, yes, we are. So I took um, another photo of a boy with a um, with a um, an empty um, can, like with uh, where do those um, basically. Oh, when um, you do telephone with, yeah, the, with line, the telephone, right? exactly with a, with a line. And it was a picture of this uh, boy, probably three or four years old. And I wrote, curiosity without constraint, for always exploring, always growing, youth isn't wasted on the young. And uh, so we almost like turned it around and made it into a marketing um, campaign. And then, of course, uh, people say, oh, yeah, but Brain Lab um, is uh, basically um, is going to be, you know, just bought by somebody and we're, you know, et cetera. So then we had another ad where we basically had a chameleon with a very long tongue and a little, um, you know, fly. And uh, then uh, we basically, um, you know, was in a text of somehow where, um, uh, you know, competitive environments uh, 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 prompt the arrival of the fittest adaptation with a healthy appetite. So, you know, maybe we acquire somebody at some point and then people said well this uh, you know say long tongue was to to masculine and then we had a feminine version of of the ad etc <laughs> so like sometimes we had our little you know wars with uh, basically the perception the competition through um, basically our our advertising uh, you know campaigns as well so but i think the point was always you know whatever we did we had fun we had uh, basically always uh, you know with uh, 
just some humor basically addressed uh, you know some of the things that were going on um in um um, in the marketplace, and I think life is short, and uh, you know, having fun with what you do is, I think, still you know, key. As that is unbelievable, Stefan. I I can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing these amazing, amazing stories. I'm going to just warn you right now. My audience is going to put a lot of pressure on me to have you back to talk about a lot of the future stuff that Brain Brain Labs doing. But again, wonderful story. Uh, thank you so much. And again, you know, I'm going to share share your LinkedIn uh, with the audience so they can follow you. But Stefan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. No, I totally enjoyed the conversation. And uh, I think maybe not right away, but let's maybe do some follow-up at some point, you know, anytime. Abs absolutely. Thank you, Stefan. And thank you all for listening. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of The State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care and we'll see you next time.